So as we look at the ninth commandment, did you know that lying isn't always condemned in the Bible? Lying is not always condemned in the Bible. I'm sure you want to figure out, how can I lie? Tell me more. The Egyptian midwives in Exodus chapter 1 lied about killing Hebrew baby boys, and they were praised for it. And the description is because they feared God. Rahab in Jericho lied to the guards as she hid Israelites in her house. And in Hebrews chapter 11, she is honored for her faith. You might think you'd lie in a moment of doubt, but she's honored for her faith. How are we getting our minds around some supposed lies of Scripture in this commandment of, um, of Exodus chapter 20? Well, we simply read the verse. It's a little bit more specific than thou shalt not lie, but you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This is talking about a court setting. This is the context. It's more specific. And that's why we don't always see the Bible condemning lying. And why, even it's in First and Second Kings, the Lord sending deceiving prophets as an act of judgment. And how he can, on the other hand, say, I never lie or change my mind. The context of this command shows it's deeper and more specific than simply lying. Now, being lied to is one thing. But this commandment is, being, is about being lied about. Having somebody talking about you and saying things that just aren't true behind your back. And that cuts far deeper to us, doesn't it? And the effects of those kinds of lies last much longer. This command is not about lying in all of its forms, but how lying affects our relationships. How our words apply in the courts of civil law in terms of justice. And how our words apply in the court of public opinion in terms of a person's reputation. And in this, there is transformative power walking in line with this commandment. Because the ninth commandment is the link between the pain of being lied about and the joy of an unexpected compliment. The photo negative of do not um, bear false witness against your neighbor comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Build one another up in love. And as we meditate on the ninth commandment for a few moments, my goal is to show how the gospel changes us into people who build one another up in love and so fulfill the ninth commandment. Now imagine a time without security cameras, without detectives, without DNA testing. Without these types of tools and resources, how could we ever know who done it? Well, even though security technology and investigative practices progressively advance generation after generation, one thing has never changed the value and importance of a witness. Witnesses were the gravitational center of the criminal justice system of the ancient world. And that's how something as simple as lying makes it into God's top ten words to live by. A witness's testimony had the power to condemn somebody to death or to save somebody's life who was accused of murder. And that's why there are so many guardrails around this commandment in the Mosaic Law. According to Deuteronomy chapter 17, a person could be punished because of a witness tes testimony, but no one was allowed to be condemned to death on the account of one single witness. And if a person was sentenced to death, two or three or more witnesses were required to actually throw the first stones. So even if a band of people got together and wanted to falsely accuse somebody, they had to put their money where their mouth was. Early in Exodus chapter 23, the Lord said he would punish anyone who gave a false testimony in court in order to condemn somebody else. In fact, if a convicted person was later found to be innocent, then those who falsely testified against him would receive whatever punishment had been given. And later in Exodus chapter 23, if you were uh, a judge or a potential witness, you were warned not to accept bribes since bribes attempt to poison the truth. Witnesses were also want, uh, wanted uh, or warned against following the crowd's popular opinion. And this commandment stands in the gap for those who would be falsely accused, who, those who would be maligned or slandered. Yet it also directs us to defend uh, with the truth. 
according to Exodus chapter 23, whether a person is poor or even your enemy, you may not deny them justice by withholding the truth. That's what was going on with all those donkeys uh, I read about. Leviticus chapter 5, a person sins if they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about. So on the one hand, we have do not lie in order to condemn someone in court. And on the other hand, we have speak up in order to defend the innocents. You and I may not sit idly by. There is something, uh, th there's not only a negative path that we must avoid, but a positive direction we ought to take. So the closest application to our lives for the ninth commandment is in our own court systems. Although in America we have a tradition of putting, you know, your hand on the Bible and saying, I promise and, or I swear to uh, speak the truth and nothing but the truth. Lawyers advise us not to say or to say very particular things. And avoid whatever liability we could, regardless of what culpability we have. So you will hear things like this, especially from politicians. I can neither confirm nor deny. In lawsuits, it seems that some have no conscience whatsoever and say whatever they need to say in order to come out on top. This command also applies to us who are governing authorities, whether judges, lawyers, police officers, teachers, anyone who has the authority to administer justice. In Luke chapter 3, Roman soldiers who were coming to faith in Jesus asked Jesus, what would repentance look like in our life? Jesus replied, don't take money from anyone by force or falsely accuse. If we're in a position of authority, we must never use our authority to threaten or pressure other people. This commandment also applies to covenant contracts and personal promises that we make with other people as they are made in a type of informal court setting. The Lord says of his own faithfulness, I will not violate my covenant, <coughs> parallel phrase, or alter what my lips have uttered. When we make promises, however big or small, we must keep them. Likewise, we must never bribe someone with a false or deceitful promise. And in all these above cases and more, we must step up to speak the truth on behalf of other people who have been lied to or taken advantage of. Remember back to Exodus 23 and Leviticus 5. You must not allow false testimony about your neighbor to persist. Finally, if we're on the chopping block, we may not bribe or coerce others to lie on our behalf, but rather accept the consequences for what we've done. But there is another court in which we can violate or fulfill this commandment. And when we violate it, it causes great damage, just like in civil courts. It's the court of public opinion where someone's reputation is at stake. Rather than using lies and deceit to pervert justice, we use lies and deceit to distort a person's reputation. I'm not sure if anyone remembers this or watched it live. I did. In 2016, two political opponents were asked, I think, the most difficult question they could have possibly been asked. They were asked a question they certainly were not prepared in any way to answer. The question was, what is something about the other candidate that you admire? We are naturally bent toward using our words in the court of public opinion to promote ourselves and defraud another person's reputation. There's two primary ways that we do this, gossip and flattery. No one wants their secrets to get out. I still remember the day, I might have been in third grade, where one of my sister's friends, my older sister, read my diary. How do you know who you can trust with your secrets? Simple. You listen to how they talk about other people. You might enjoy it when somebody comes to you with a secret word about another person's life. But just know, if they're doing that to other people, you can be sure they're going to do that to you. And so Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19 says, A gossip betrays confidence. Therefore, avoid anyone who talks too much. When the question comes up, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? We need to interrogate the questioner, even if it's ourselves, and we're wanting to say that or ask that question. Why are we asking that question? 
what are we hoping to accomplish? Perhaps someone is in need and we want to recruit people who can help them. But if not, we should take a serious look at our motives and think twice before we talk to some people about other people. And when you hear gossip, redirect it. Depending on the circumstance, you can suggest that the gossiper, don't call them a gossiper, that's not polite, but you can suggest to the gossiper that they go directly to that person and talk to them. Other circumstances might call for us defending the one who's being gossiped about. Even if by simply saying, oh, I'll reach out to them. Thank you for letting me know. And see if everything's all right and if there's a way I can encourage them. The Lord hates gossip. As he says in Psalm 101, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Second, uh, second way that we do this, flattery. Wanting to get something out of somebody else, even if just to make ourselves look good, we make sure to compliment them however we can. Yet Proverbs chapter 29 warns us, those who flatter their neighbors are spreading a net for their feet. Well, how so? Well, because when you flatter another person, you set them on their way, believing something about themselves that just isn't true. How does this outfit make me look? If I ever ask you a question like that personally, please tell me the truth. I'm asking you so you can help protect me from looking like a fool in public. Be my friend. Tell me the truth. Now, some people have thin skin. Some people have thick skin. So you need to be wise in how you respond to those kinds of questions. But however you frame your response, be honest. Do not spread a net for their feet to fall into. This verse could also be applied to ourselves. We spread a net for our own feet when we flatter ourselves. When we want to make and exaggerate our circumstance to look good. In the first few months of moving to Sandwich, I went to the local barber shop. The, my, my barber asked me what brought us here. I said, I became the pastor of Forestdale Church just down the street. Do you go to church? She says, Yeah. Wanting to make herself look good. Yeah, I go to church. I said, that's great. What church do you go to? She said, Corpus Christi, which is the local Roman Catholic church. But then I asked her a question she didn't expect. When's the last time you went to church? She said, oh, uh, like 15 years ago. <laughs> when someone asks us how much we make, how often we exercise, what our diet's like, or something about our talents, education, or background, it is far too easy to exaggerate the reality and flatter ourselves. Social economics, uh, economists say that tennis players, when they, when, when they report how good they are, simply refer in their minds to the best performances they've ever had, not rather to the average of their performance. There are many examples of self-flattery in Scripture, and we, we always see how it leads down, us down a bumpy and broken road. For example, wanting to save his own skin, Abraham lied twice that his wife was his sister. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira wanted to impress the church by selling some of their property and donating the money to the church. And although they claimed to be donating all the money that they, that they um, acquired from the sale of their property— they, they secretly kept some of it back for themselves, only to be struck down by the Lord and left with nothing. Whether we lie in court, whether we gossip about, about a friend, or flatter ourselves, it is like putting a stick of dynamite in a mountainside road. When it explodes, it not only destroys the path of life as it was meant to be, but it also tumbles down so many boulders, creating so much more damage than we ever thought we would, could create. And it will only come back on us before too long, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. Everyone will give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Loose lips sink ships. Even today, countless people are serving prison sentences for crimes they did not commit because of a malicious witness or a corrupt judge. In former times in America, this meant that innocent people were sent to the electric chair. Gossip and slander 
have destroyed family relationships and even blown up historic churches just like ours. Even well-intentioned flattery sends people out in the public square deluded about what the public might think of them. And everyone who has suffered because of lies, slander, or gossip, or flattery will probably remember those wrongs the rest of their life. These wounds cut too deep. And that's why we need a Savior who can sympathize with us and redeem the damage that's caused by false testimonies. And in Jesus Christ, we have such a Savior. Jesus himself endured the pain of being lied about. Throughout his life, as we saw when we were looking in the Gospel of John, he defended himself against the false accusations about his own identity. As Jesus continued to claim he was sent from God the Father, the Pharisees despised him all the more. In the public square, they questioned his mental health by calling him demon-possessed. They even empowered racist remarks, calling him a Samaritan. They said, see, we knew it all along. Toward the end of Jesus' life, not only did his closest friends abandon him and deny that they knew him in public, but they did this while he was under trial, through, going through a death sentence that was empowered by false accusations. Jesus knows this pain. Yet in all this, Jesus was intentionally walking through the purpose for which his father sent him. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. He didn't value him, although he had done no violence and had never spoken deceitfully. Why did he endure such a trial? Why did God put him to such a test? For a few reasons. One reason, in order to become this kind of Savior that we need, the kind of Savior who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Another reason was to die, to die on a cross according to God's purpose, to atone for the sin of whoever would repent of their sin and cling to him in faith. And third, Jesus did this in order to be awarded by God with resurrection life and seated on heaven's throne to judge all creation. So that perfect justice will one day be established on the last day. And in this way, the redemption that's offered in Jesus has an answer for every way in which our words um, about other people have derailed the cause of justice and defrauded someone's reputation. For example, because Jesus died for our sin under false accusations, we can be free to be open about who we really are. And confess our sin. Though we are so concerned with what people think about us, that we leverage gossip, slander, and flattery for our own benefit, the gospel offers us the freedom of true authenticity, where we can be open about who we really are by confessing our sin. And we're safe doing so, because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For Christ has atoned for sin. And, co and covers us in his own righteousness. He awards us with his own reputation. And second, because Jesus rose from the dead to reign over all, we can be assured that perfect justice will be established for all those who are falsely accused. The gospel promises perfect justice to anyone who has been wrongfully accused of crimes and all those who have suffered as a result of gossip, slander, or flattery. We can find our ultimate vindication in the glory of the resurrection of Jesus and in the final judgment of the wicked. And therefore, we're set free from needing to defend ourselves at all costs and can instead occupy our minds and time with building others up. And when we have put on the confidence that the gospel gives us in these ways and more, and we grasp onto the significance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we will be turned around as if in a dance to completely change the way we apply our words to other people because the gospel sets us free in many different ways and changes everything. Rather than using lies to slander or promote ourselves, the gospel called us to build up others in love. In Ephesians, the apostle Paul writes how the gospel reshapes God's new people and how they use their words. Chapter 4, verse 15 says, speak the truth in love. Chapter 4, verses 29 and 25, which you've read. 
Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we all are all members of one body. Don't let any unwholesome or corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up according to someone's need, so that your words give grace to all those who hear it. And so here's two ways that we can apply this new calling to our life. Ways that I'll summarize just by saying zip your lip on the one hand and open your eyes. Zip your lip and open your eyes. So first, zip your lip. A few weeks ago at our Thursday night discipleship group, it was like the, um, the grief fest. You know, it, it was just the moment of time where God happened to have everybody in a difficult place in their life. And we didn't get to discussing any of the Bible reading that we were supposed to have done or any of those other holy things you're supposed to do in discipleship groups. We were just confiding on one another and sharing how we were doing. Every guy went around and t until, until finally, if I could say that, one person said, well, enough about us, Ethan. How are you doing? How refreshing is, are those words? Enough about me. How are you? Imagine that. So first, zip your lip. And here's what I mean by that. We've got to stop talking about ourselves so much. Be more curious to hear someone else's thoughts than to share your own. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Outdo one another in showing honor. Show you honor the person you're talking with by being curious about something they might have to say. It shows zero honor to a person when we use them as a, as a uh, physical recording device. We don't need you for you as long as you have ears. Anyone will do. This shows the other person they're actually quite expendable to us. There's nothing you, that we are demonstrating we uniquely value about who they are. Since anyone with ears can do what they're doing. On the other hand, we show unique honor to the person we're with when we let this conversation be only what it could be because they're here. Namely, by asking what might be on their mind and also what might have come to their mind from the things that we've been talking about. If we actually love the person we're talking to, wouldn't we be curious to know these things? Wouldn't we be curious to hear what's on their mind? Neither would we feel ready to respond to something they've said until we've understood what they've said. Perhaps by asking a follow-up question to go deeper. So in conversation, don't be satisfied talking on and on about yourself and your opinion and how this or that makes you feel. Zip your lip. Become more curious about what's on their mind. Ask them a good question and then respond with a second question that touches on something specific they just said. Showing you're really listening. You're really interested. And in this way, we will build each other up by showing them dignity and demonstrating we value their presence. Second, open your eyes. In other words, when you see something, say something. One of my biggest regrets in ministry was not about something I said, but about something I did not say. I was in youth ministry in Southern California. I had been there maybe a year. We we're starting to pick up some social momentum and forming b deeper relationships with these students. One student, I think he was in 11th grade, was playing guitar and leading our music time each week. And I was so proud of him. And I was very excited to have him because I was doing that before he came. And there was a girl who stepped up on Moon Sing. And I was so excited about these students taking the lead on something. But then all of a sudden he left and went to another youth group. And so I went to one of my youth pastor friends, and I was just grieving over this. How could, I feel abandoned. How could he just leave me like this? He was so great. He, I had so much, I, so many ideas for him and how he could shape this ministry and train other people and do this and that and that and this. And he said, well, did you tell him that? I said, no. And I couldn't believe what I had done. It's about what I did not say. If you see something, say something. Now, I love that you appreciate each other and you tell me as the pastor all the time how much you appreciate other ch each other. But that doesn't count. You've got to tell them. Go tell that person. Do they know you feel that way? 
If you have dreams for somebody else, do they know you have dreams for them? It only counts if you tell them. If you see something, say something. Open your eyes and let us see all the wonderful people God has put in our life. And let's pursue them, actively seeking out a way we can speak into their life and give them a word of encouragement. You don't need an excuse. You don't need a special reason. Just do it. And think about how this kind of community would look. A kind of community who, rather than putting other people down or lying to get ahead, are looking for ways to build each other up in love. Does our common world not long for these kinds of relationships? Relationships that are built on open and respectful dialogue, despite all our differing opinions where we show each other honor and dignity and respect in the way that we talk to them and talk about them. Doesn't our common world long for this? Well, who else should demonstrate these kinds of relationships than the church? Than God's own people who have been rescued from the penalty and the power of sin and empowered to live in his new way by the Spirit. Now, as we walk toward the purpose of the ninth commandment, we ourselves will be changed along the way into people who don't just love each other, but actually like each other too. Did you know there's a difference? I think it's easier probably to love people than to like them. But when we walk alongside each other, we start to like each other a little bit too. I've experienced this in my own life in the military with people I didn't like that I had to serve with despite how I felt. I hope this will happen to my kids as they grow up in the same roof. They didn't choose each other. Serving alongside people that we wouldn't otherwise become friends with actually changes our own hearts. We see this kind of change in stories in movies all the time. Anytime two unlikely friends are stuck together for a length of time and have to rely on each other to make it through. What movies are you thinking of? Woody and Buzz? Forrest Gump and Bubba? I mean, the stories are endless. Two unlikely friends. That's a great story. Unlikely friends who come out on the other side closer together. Why? Well, at first, the only reason they cooperate with each other to begin with is just to get things over with so they can move on with their lives and be rid of each other. But as they go along, something inside them begins to change. A flicker of affection sparks for each other, and it grows and grows. The more experiences they share together on their journey especially when they have to overcome obstacles together. Probably the best example, my favorite example, Legolas and Gimli from Lord of the Rings. They finally reach their destination, and they can finally have what they've been wanting, to be away from each other. But then they realize just how much they've changed and how close they've become. As we build up one another in love, we eventually get to the place where we realize, you know, they're not so bad. And I'm afraid I've maybe become somewhat fond of them. In a small church like ours, it's harder to find people that you really connect with. It's just statistics. You have a smaller sample size. On your first visit to this church, you may have even doubted there were social benefits to ever coming back. But do not think it a coincidence that you're right here, right now, And they are too. You know those other people you're not too sure about. Those other people who have also been attending this church that you haven't gotten to know. And don't underestimate the transforming power of giving yourself over to the people of God, uh, to the people that God has seen fit to put in front of you. After laboring for years in ministry over the church in Thessalonica, the apostle Paul writes to them this, We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, because that was our job, but also our lives as well. Could we look back at years together as a church and say that about each other, that we were delighted to share our lives with each other as well as the gospel? And so Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. 
The gospel changes us into people who build one, an, one another up in love in a way this world really is not used to seeing. Praise be to God for that. Let's take a brief moment now just to respond to God in prayer. What is something the sermon made you think about that you need to pray about? Let's take a brief moment of quiet to give our hearts to God.